Our president has recently surrounded himself with some men of God. And I think that's very, very important, and it's a very good choice that he has made. You remember me saying to you that a number of years ago, when President Clinton first came to office, uh, that I asked the chaplain of the United States Senate and Congress if he knew of any believers, any believers, that were in the cabinet or round about the president. And after a long pause and almost a sigh of sadness or despair, he said, I know of no believer in Jesus Christ that is anywhere close to President Bill Clinton. And then he paused for a minute and he said, but, but I think a lower staff member, his wife may be a Christian. That's how far it went. Today, our president very wisely has chosen to try and surround himself with three people who know God. One, his pastor. Secondly, Tony Campolo. And thirdly, Gordon McDonald. And he is meeting with these uh, three men on a very frequent and regular basis in order to help strengthen him in times of spiritual temptation, in times of stress, and in times of need. And that is very commendable. And we need to pray for our president because he is a moral leader. And unfortunately, those around him in the past have been leading us in an area of moral decline. Now, the unfortunate truth, though, is this, that he could surround himself with a hundred godly men, and they could be with him round the clock, and he could still fall to sin, because there is one person that must be a part of the equation. Not someone who's going to be on the outside, not somebody who's going to be around him, but somebody who's going to be in him. And that is the Spirit of God. Open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5. And today we're going to look at that one person who on the inside, can bring the kind of control and direction and, as the Bible calls it, fruit of the Spirit that allows us to gain control over <clears throat> the natural tendencies, the sinful tendencies, the harmful tendencies of life. Thankfully, our president got it right at the minister's prayer breakfast when he acknowledged that it was sin. And that's something that we all need to acknowledge, is that we sin. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, Paul says to them, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of of the sinful nature. Your translation may say, walk by the Spirit. Literally, it's walk by the Spirit, but it has a sense of living by the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the person that we are dependent upon, not on the outside, but he's got to get into the inside by faith in Jesus Christ to give us the strength, to give us the power that we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That is the sin that so regularly hurts our soul and the quality of our life and relationships. Now, I'd like to just review briefly, theologically, what are the works of the Spirit of God in the life of a person 
who has trusted Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit begins by convicting us of sin. Before we know Jesus Christ, he convicts us of sin. He is in the world and in the dimension of the spiritual world through our conscience and through sometimes godly people and sometimes from hearing the word, he acknowledges in our life the conviction of sin, that this is wrong and that is wrong. And maybe we will argue as non-believers as to what is right and what is wrong, but everybody has a right and wrong. And the Holy Spirit does that. He convicts us of sin and he brings us to an understanding of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that by believing in that gospel, that good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and acknowledging that I am a sinner like all human beings, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. It's appointed unto every person wants to die, and after that, the judgment. We will all stand before God someday, whether we believe it or not. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of that sin, and he reveals to us Jesus Christ, and then he regenerates us. When we put faith in Jesus Christ, we are not only physically alive, but we become spiritually alive. And we enter into the third dimension of the spiritual relationship of God when we understand that there is a seen world and an unseen world. And that the physical pain I experience on earth is part of this earth, but there is an emotional and there is a spiritual pain that I also experience. And that is all part of the non-material. And that faith in Jesus Christ brings a new life, a regenerating life. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes within. Now, it's still good to have pastors. It's still good to have Christian friends. It's still good to have brothers and sisters in Christ. But you can surround a person with a thousand people, and if they don't have that one person, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in their life, they are still going to be enslaved to sin. The Holy Spirit then indwells us. A very mystical understanding, hard to explain, but you know it when you experience it because it's a change of life. He indwells us. He baptizes us into the body of Christ, which makes us the family. The Bible tells us he seals us. His special presence in our life guarantees our salvation. He endows us with spiritual gifts to serve. He fills us with power. He teaches us the word of God. He guides our lives. He assures us of our salvation. He assists us in prayer. He produces, as we see in this text, spiritual fruit. That is why the Holy Spirit is so very important in overcoming the flesh. As Paul says, so I say, live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I think uh, that a mature believer in Jesus Christ, if they could someday rub, uh, rub a, a, a magic genie lamp and a genie would come out and grant one wish, I think that wish would be that we might overcome our sin. For it is sin that takes away the quality and the joy of life interrupts personal relationships, causes us to do things that bring wrong pain to us and to others. But there is no magic genie that's going to come out of a bottle, but there is the Spirit of Christ that God has given us to dwell within these physical bodies, these earthen vessels. And it is that Spirit that will give us victory over the flesh, or as the NIV translation calls it, the sinful nature. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. It's a parallel passage to this, and it's one that maybe elaborates on it a little bit more fully. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A person who has put faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has been granted eternal forgiveness, and there is never, ever judgment again. God wipes away all of our sins. 
Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law or the principle of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weak by the sinful nature or the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to become a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who did not live, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but who will live according to the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that sets us free from these sinful tendencies and sinful desires that ruin our lives. You got to have a, a bit of compassion or prayer for these young men in Gross Point who did not have the ability to control the desires of the flesh and who will now be serving some jail time or some prison time. You would hope that someday they might know the power of the Spirit of God that can bring control and direction to life. But that is true for each and every one of us. Without the power of the Spirit in our lives, we would not be able to overcome our sin. Why is that? Well, let's look at this person that's talked about in Romans and other books of the Bible called the old man. The old man is represented in the Bible as a non-believer, somebody who has not put faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about the faith of the head, the intellectual ascent. I believe in Jesus Christ, like I believe in George Washington, like I believe in Abraham Lincoln, like I believe in Aristotle. These are just historical people. It is a trust. It is a trust that goes from the head to the heart and that causes one to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible talks about the old man. The old man is a non-believer. The person is from the old creation. In other words, they are in Adam. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created Adam and Eve. Eve was deceived by the serpent, but Adam fell to sin willfully, knowingly, stupidly, like all of us men ever since that time. And so we are all in Adam. And when you are in Adam, you have what we call an Adamic nature. That is a sinful nature. And we are enslaved to sin. And all we can do is sin. And sin is our master. And we are under the tutelage of the law that constantly tries to tell us this is wrong, this is wrong. But that law does not provide the power to overcome sin. And its ultimate destiny is death. Now, when a person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible says they become a new man. God says a new man. You are a believer. You are a new creation in Christ. If anyone believes in Jesus Christ, they are a new creation. The old things will pass away. All things will become new. Are Christians sinless? No. But Christians sin less. Amen? That's the goal. We're never going to be sinless. But our goal is to sin less. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the new believer. God gives us a new nature. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We are enslaved to righteousness. No longer are we enslaved to sin. We have been set free. And now we are enslaved to righteousness. And righteousness should be the basic direction of our lives. Now, Paul does say that sin still operates in me. I still have to overcome sin, but it's not an equal, as I will show in a moment. We are under grace, and the result of our lives is going to be life. Now, unfortunately, there has been some confusion about the spiritual entity of the Christian. And this is what I call spiritual schizophrenia, or uh, split personality, which I do not think is true. One of the most common illustrations 
of the Christian life or Christian experience is this black dog, white dog illustration. How many have ever heard or seen this illustration somewhere? That we as Christians, we have an old nature and we have a new nature. And unfortunately, that's what the NIV translation seems to suggest, and it's not a good translation. There, it's the flesh. What they translate the sin nature is simply the word flesh. It means indwelling sin. And there's this tendency to say, well, we're, it's, it's like you have a black dog and a white dog in your life. And the one you feed the most is the one who dominates, as if you got an equal battle there. That there's an old nature and there's a new nature. There's a sinfulness and there's a godliness. And it's some kind of an equal fight. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach two natures. It teaches we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And that, yes, there is still indwelling sin, but it is not equal to the power of the Holy Spirit or the power of the new life that we have. I mean, if you think you're a loser, you're going to be a loser. Know this. You're a saint. You're a winner. We are overcomers. We're going to progress. No, we're not going to be sinless, but we're going to sin less. And the less we sin, the more we will enjoy life. And we will enjoy our relationships. Now, in very brief summary, and you will probably want to just read this uh, today or tomorrow or for the next week, Romans chapter 6, which parallels this. Romans chapter 6 says this, When I believe in Jesus Christ, I am co-baptized with him. Baptism was a term of identification. I become identified with Jesus Christ. And I am co-buried with him. When he died, I died with him. When he was buried, I was buried with him. And more importantly, when he was raised, I was raised. It says that we have been raised up with him that we might walk in newness of life. And that is the co-resurrection and so Paul says he says you need to know these things you need to reckon them or count on them just don't know them here in your head you got to know them in your life you got to count on them all right and then thirdly you need to present yourself to God for God to be able to use you and if you will do that Paul says we are slaves of righteousness, of the good things, of the positive things, and we are free from sin. And that is the blessed life. This is what I would pray, not just for my president and for all my leaders, but for all the world. For all, each and every one of us, to be set free free from the bondage of sin, the cravings and the desires that cause us to do sinful things that harm ourselves, that harm other people, that harm those in our world. It's going to be a wonderful life when we finally can set aside the struggles and the conflicts because we are completely and totally perfected and set free from sin and enslaved to righteousness. Romans chapter 6 says we never have to sin again because victory is always there because of the righteousness that God has provided for us. Will we always have victory? No. But God provides continued forgiveness when we don't. And so it is the life of Jesus Christ that is of greatest value to us. As Paul says in verse 17, for the flesh or the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature or the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. I don't know what your experience is, but that's my experience. 
My experience is that there is a part of me that wars against my soul. There is a part of me that wants me to not follow God. But I know also that there is the Holy Spirit and the new creation. And as I depend upon that new creation and that Holy Spirit, I overcome that sin. There is no sinless perfection. Neither is there any good excuse for sin. Understand this. Sin is never satisfied or gratified. Let me say that again. Sin is never satisfied or gratified. Sin always wants more and like any addiction requires greater amounts of intensity to temporarily pacify its desires. And that is the sad thing about folks who do not know Jesus Christ is they are bound to that sinful nature where we were all at at one point and we're no better than others other than the fact that we have received the grace of God. But sin, sin is like any addiction. It wants more. It wants more. You can't pacify it. It intensifies. It grows. And it always comes back for more and more and more. And that is the enslavement of it all. In Galatians 5.18, Paul says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That is what is liberating, is that the power of the Holy Spirit sets us free from the law and the condemnation of conviction and sets us on a path of victory. Martin Luther wrote this about his relationship to the law. He says, when I was a monk, I thought by and by that I was utterly cast away. I mean, Martin Luther became a Catholic monk and priest and a scholar out of sincere dedication of wanting to overcome the cravings of his life and to find some kind of holiness. When I was a monk, I thought by and by that I was utterly cast away. If at any time I felt the lust of the flesh, if I felt any evil emotion... I felt that I would fall. If at that time I had rightly understood those sentences of Paul, referring to the word of God, I should not have so miserably tormented myself, but should have thought and said to myself, as I commonly now do, Martin, thou shalt not utterly be without sin, for thou hast flesh. Thou shalt therefore flee the battle thereof. Despair not, resist it strongly. Victory is mine. Amen. There's a man who's telling it like the struggle is. And he obviously was greatly used by God. Galatians 5.19 says, The acts of the flesh or the sinful nature are obvious. And then Paul gives us a grocery list. Now, I want to look briefly at this grocery list uh, of sins. There are about five or six different grocery lists in the Bible that list various categories of sin. And the categories, we notice Paul does group them together with some uh, similarity, but there is also, as we look at them, a greater intensity. He begins, first of all, with sins of sexuality, immorality, or as the NIV translates it, sexual immorality, and then impurity, and then sensuality. These are the three categories that Paul lists of what I would call sexual sins. Now, the first one, immorality, represents sexual intercourse outside of God's creative order. It's called fornication elsewhere. Uh, It's interesting that even pagan writers had lists of sins. But fornication or immorality or adultery was hardly considered a sin. See, that wasn't in their list. Uh, I don't think it's in the list of America either, as I look at the national polls. You know, who cares about sexual sins? You know, that's a private matter. 
Well, not before God it isn't, and uh, not before one's family and loved ones. In fact, the Bible says that sexual sin, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee from sexual immorality. All sins a person commits are outside the body, but the one who sins sexually sins against their own body. It is one of the deepest emotional and traumatic sins. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be holy, that you should be pure, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Yes, we have immorality. Uh, this word was also used in uh, ancient times of prostitution. Uh, on uh, the uh, PBS station, I watched recently a, a show on uh, morality in America, and unfortunately, prostitution is a very, very uh, big uh, problem. In fact, uh, the statistic was given that in the state of Nevada, the government-controlled, regulated brothels uh, serviced over a half a million clients last year. With all the sexually transmitted diseases and all the rest, it's just unbelievable that that continues to go on. But is it unbelievable? No, because it's part of the enslavement of the sinful nature. Well, the next thing, impurity. Impurity is a general term for not only the misuse of sexuality, but moral evil also. And it goes beyond just mere adultery or fornication or sex outside of marriage to a, a more degrading kind of passion. And then the third one, sensuality, is the throwing off of restraint and the flaunting of public indecency. What comes to my mind when I look at this word uh, are things like uh, the gay parade, uh, the uh, uh, cable pornography, internet pornography, uh, and all of those kinds of things. Recently, the United States military, underneath the urging of the chaplains, uh, suggested that uh, the uh, government stores quit selling pornography. What an uproar. What an uproar. And yet they're saying we have all these problems of sexual harassment and misconduct amongst the military. Why are we feeding the minds of our military with this garbage? Let's help clean it up. And yet moral outrage as if something bad was happening. Well, the next category is the sins of spiritism. And he lists idolatry and sorcery. Now, in America, we don't face idolatry in the physical sense uh, so much uh, as you do in uh, Central America and South America and in all of the various Asian uh, uh, countries and uh, those kinds of things. But idolatry is still a major world problem in the religious area. It's putting anything before God, particularly graven images. Now, whether there is Wherever there is idolatry, there is also immorality. And we see that in the New Testament, Paul equates desire or greed with idolatry in Colossians 3, 5. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Idolatry is putting anything in front of God and your relationship to him. And certainly greed or covetousness fits into that category. The second category of sins is sorcery. Now, in ancient Near Eastern times, sorcery involved also the dispensing of drugs for the purpose of, of uh, hallucinations or even for the purpose of poisoning and killing someone. Uh, Rome, this was so serious that Rome actually had laws against sorcery. Today, we see sorcery uh, probably most uh, publicly in the phone calls. You know, call up such and such a number and get your fortune told. That is sorcery. We have seen a rise in Ouija boards and in witchcraft. Uh, if you've ever traveled to New Orleans... You see entire streets devoted to fortune tellers and tarot cards. And there is a, 
a great rise in America of this area of sorcery. The next set of sins are sins of social conflicts. And uh, he talks about enmity. Enmity is strife and, and uh, anger between people. Enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, murder. And again, there is an intensity that seems to grow in these lists of sins. And all of these deal with sins that separate people, what I would call interpersonal type sins. Jesus says in Luke 6, 27, but I, tell you, uh, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. People today don't want to just get even, they want to get ahead on their revenge. Jesus, uh, Paul says in Romans 10, 20, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals upon his head. A believer is to love, not to hate, is to be a peacemaker, not one who falls into divisions. In James chapter 4, verse 1, Paul, or James says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight, but you do not have because you do not ask from God. Yes, the sinful nature that dwells within the non-believer creates these kinds of characteristics, enmities and strife, jealousy, outbursts, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, murder. I don't think I want to be a part of that community. <laughs> That's not where I want to live. But this is so often the kinds of characteristics that destroy relationships and destroy families. Paul elsewhere says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of, that, of uh, malice. Yes, sins of social conflict. And then finally, sins of what I've called debauchery or wastedness. That would be drunkenness. We've talked about this uh, in uh, one of our Sunday evening services, that uh, the Bible does not condemn drinking or the partaking of wine or something like that, but it certainly speaks out against drunkenness. And drunkenness is involved, or alcohol is involved, in at least 60% of crimes that are committed in America, statistically. Alcohol, they say, weakens the will, weakens the thought process, and people will do things that they often would not do if they were sober. And so drunkenness is a deed of the flesh. Drunkenness leads to carousing, or as the uh, NIV translates it, a kind of, uh, of um, let's see what word it is. Uh, they use the term orgies and the like. Carousing is the drunken state in which you turn towards sexual promiscuity and the abuse and misuse of people. Now, Paul concludes it by saying this, those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The deeds of the flesh are representative of the non-believer. These are the things that they are enslaved to. And it is not my purpose to dwell upon these because... These are simply the problem. But let it be known that those who practice, if a person's life is characterized by these things, then chances are they are not a believer because they are not experiencing the power of God that gives them the victory over sin. You cannot judge a person by their words. You must judge them by their life. Did not Jesus say, you shall know them by their, what? Fruits. And Jesus was a fruit inspector. Now, I'm not a fruit inspector. I'll let each individual inspect their own lives. But the truth is this. The deeds of the flesh 
are characterized by these sins, people entrapped, enslaved to them, without the power and the ability to overcome them. And those who practice such things, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. On the other hand, Paul has said what of us as believers? He says, hey, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And that's what I pray for all people and particularly for my president right now. That Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see, that's the power of God. The presence of Christ in our life, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And as we continue this passage next week, we will look at the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, and the one he finishes with is the self-control over life that is produced by the Holy Spirit. In closing, I just would like to emphasize this one last important point so that we don't get this wrong. Christians are not sinless people but they do sin less and that's our goal we don't want to come across as if we are better than anyone else we are simply people who have acknowledged the grace of God and have trusted Jesus Christ and that trust in Jesus Christ provides the opportunity to sin less and if we look at our lives this morning and we look back six months or we look back 12 months or we look back 18 months and we can't observe a pattern of sinning less, then we need to look at what is wrong. Uh, have we not yet trusted in Jesus Christ? If we haven't yet trusted in Jesus Christ, then it's a very simple thing. It's to acknowledge that I'm a sinner, like all human beings, that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and by acknowledging my sin and believing that he died on the cross for my sins and that he rose, and by following him, he puts a new nature, a new life within me, then I have the power. And if you know that you have the power and you have made that decision in your life, then what you need to do is simply look and say, well, am I following the spiritual disciplines of worship and prayer and the study of the Bible? Because we as believers, we're not old man, new man. We're not two natures. We're saints. We're believers in Jesus Christ. We're new creations. We're on the way up. We're going to overcome. We are conquerors. And we will learn to sin less. Let's pray.